The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the September 10th, 1.30 p.m. meeting of the North Carolina Local Government Commission. I'll now call the meeting to order and ask Cindy, our secretary, uh, the clerk to the board to call a roll and describe meeting procedures. Thank you. Cindy Aiken speaking. <clears throat> we'll do a quick roll call of our members. Starting with Auditor Holmes, who just logged in, I think. Can you hear us okay? Present, yes. Okay. Uh, we hear you just barely. Up. Thank you. Secretary Marshall? Here. Is here in person. Secretary Penny? Here. Also in person. Mr. Burns? Here. Virtually. And Mr. Butler? Here. Here in person. Ms. Ms. Harvey is at the moment absent, is that right? No. Okay. Uh, yeah. And Councilwoman Hoffman? Uh, let's make sure your mic is working. We see it. She's here virtually and we'll check on her sound. Mr. Philbeck? Here. Got his sound going. And Treasurer Falwell? Here. First. Try it. Councilwoman Hoffman again to make sure we can hear you. Here. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, as per usual, this meeting is being recorded and will be made available to the public. So it's to the Department of State Treasurer's recording of public meetings policy. If everyone will please identify yourself when speaking, either online or here in the room, when it's your turn. If you are participating virtually, please remember to mute yourself when you are not speaking. Um, our AV uh, oh, <coughs> will not lose connection. Sometimes it happens. If it does have a connection loss, the meeting may be continuing. The audio may be continuing to be broadcast, so please keep that in mind, and we hope we get that not happen. It does. If we have changed, the agenda is posted on the website, www.nctreasurer.com. If there are changes to this agenda, they will be announced during the meeting. As per usual, we take all votes by roll call. And without objection, your motions and seconds will be considered yes votes unless you want to indicate otherwise during the roll call. Please remember here in the room, these microphones in the ceiling are extremely sensitive. They pick up whispering, paper rustling, which I am a offender of that, uh, food, packages being opened. If you have a conversation you need to have, please uh, move to the lobby for that. And uh, we will take a quick roll call of our staff. Debbie Tomasco is in present, secretary. Jennifer Wimmer, director of debt management. Is Kendra on the line? I'm here, Cindy. Thank you, Kendra Boyle, Director of Fiscal Management, and I've already announced myself, Cindy Aiken, Council. That's all. Thank you, Treasurer. Thank you. If uh, you'll stand and join us for our Pledge of Allegiance, and then Secretary Marshall will lead us in the salute to North Carolina flag. I salute the flag of North Carolina and pledge to the old North State love, loyalty, and faith. Thank you. Uh, as you came to the Treasurer's office today, you noticed that our Flags were at half staff, and that's in honor of uh, Representative Kelly Alexander, who I served with for many years uh, from the Charlotte area, uh, and had a fantastic relationship with uh, Representative Alexander. So let's be sure to keep his community and uh, his family in our thoughts and prayers. We have a conflict of interest statement. Please take a moment to review the agenda. Does anyone present have an actual potential or the appearance of a conflict of interest regarding the matters of the board? Mr. Treasurer. Yes, sir. This is John Burns, virtually. Um, before we move further in the preliminary agenda, I, I, I noted that the Cabarrus County matter was not on the September agenda, even though it was anticipated to be so. And I was wondering if it would be proper at this point uh, and if so, I would move to add the Cabarrus County um, 
human services project to the agenda for this meeting? Uh, we have spent an inordinate amount of time, uh, Mr. Burns, on the Cabarrus County situation. Uh, uh, an incredible amount of time. Uh, I would like for staff to address uh, what it is that you're describing to do, and then I'll, I'll answer your question. Thank you, sir. I'll hold my motion until I hear from staff. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would you rather do that? It's not going to limit you making your motion, so you want me to get through things, or what is your preference? Well, I suppose we could approve the minutes from the last meeting and, and go forward. I, I, did, I just I didn't want the agenda to be approved without the discussion of, of the item, whether the item should be on the agenda. Um, and I, I'll defer to the chair on, on the proper timing of that as long as we're able to discuss that before the agenda is approved by the body. I look forward to discussing that. So thank I you. Appreciate that. that. OK, I give staff a moment to. They're in one gear. I fully, in fully understand that. I appreciate that. I don't want to put them through the ringer. I appreciate it. So uh, we have a motion to uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes of October 6th. August. Sorry. Apologize. August 6th. Sorry. I think Alder Holmes made a motion. I'll second. Okay. <clears throat> Alder Holmes makes a motion, second by uh, Philbeck. Any uh, further discussion about approving the meeting minutes of August 6th? Okay. Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Okay. Uh, minutes, Paul Spielbeck, Secretary Marshall. Aye. Secretary Penny. Aye. Mr. Burns. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Butler. Aye. Ms. Harvey not join us. Okay. Uh, absent. Councilwoman Hoffman. Aye. Thank you. And Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next, call your attention to the attachment A, which is the OPEP report, which talks about the unfunded health care and pension and LEO liabilities of uh, the applicants that are before us. Uh, it's interesting how God made our hand at any time, any time that you point a finger at someone, there are three more pointing back at you. Uh, the biggest offender in the state of not funding their unfunded health care liabilities is the state itself. So uh, we recently uh, gave preliminary approval to the 2024 uh, OPEB liability for the state of North Carolina, which comes in about $34 billion uh, in excess of one year's of the state budget. So I'm saying this to say that uh, these counties and cities and local communities uh, that are acknowledging this situation and actually putting money toward these real liabilities, uh, hats off to them. Uh, the gold star goes to the city of Winston-Salem, which is not on our agenda, but they recognized this problem 39 years ago and started putting money toward their unfunded liabilities and their plans currently about 90% funded. Uh, then I think Mayor Venry was the mayor of Charlotte and the Charlotte City Council uh, decided to do what Winston-Salem did about four decades ago and I think they have a couple hundred million dollars uh, toward their liability. Uh, <clears throat> many of our major counties and cities uh, have started putting money toward the unfunded liabilities and uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that, as I said earlier, the unfunded liability of the state of North Carolina is uh, north of $33 billion. So uh, when I talk about these issues, I'm as frustrated with the state itself as I am anybody that ever comes in front of this commission. So. That's attachment A. Uh, attachment B, uh, Town of Black Mountain, UAL unit. Uh, this is Jennifer Wimmer, uh, Director of Debt Management. We have one unit today who is coming for approval under the requirements of um, the UAL um, legislation. It is the Town of Black Mountain. They are coming for um, a several vehicles, um, two police vehicles and a town administration vehicle, total of 194,000. Um, they do have their terms set with Truist, 4.88% um, for four years. 
Um, and we um, would like to turn it over now to Kendra to um, give an explanation of the UAL status for Town of Black Mountain. Thank you, Jennifer. This is Kendra Boyle. Um, the Town of Black Mountain is on the unit assistance list for the first time due to some internal control issues that were identified in their fiscal year 2023 audit report. Um, their audit report was submitted late um, and had findings related to reconciliations not being done timely and some budget violations. Now, this is attributed to mainly to Black Mountain having undergone a financial software conversion. And as we've heard from many units, sometimes this can either create problems or identify problems for the unit of local government. And in Black Mountain's case, um, they had some subsidiary ledgers that were not reconciled, and this led to some delays in completing the audit. Also, there were budget violations. Most notably, there were um, budget violations in the capital projects fund. Now, this is related to some, some issues in the software conversion and with how the software carried over balances for multi-year projects. Um, in response to these, these identified issues, the unit has hired a third-party CPA to assist them in strengthening their internal controls. Um, and they have, I have received word that the auditors have completed their field work for fiscal year 24. So there's an anticipation that there will not be a, a repeat late finding on their audit report. Um, the town finance officer and town manager have been responsive to all the inquiries from the LGC staff, and they provided a thorough response to their, their indicators of concern that have put them on the unit assistance list. And they have a plan of action that, um, if implemented timely and appropriately, should address these internal control weaknesses that have been identified in the audit. Um, and again, they are on the unit assistance list for internal control issues, not for their general fund or their water and sewer fund. Um, and these are both the funds that would be um, paying the debt service for this issuance. So I, I'm confident that the, the debt service related to their request today will not have a detrimental effect on their financial condition. Else, staff's recommendation is staff uh, is recommending that we move approval toward uh, the Black Mountain application. Uh, do I hear a motion? Marshall, so moved. Thank you, Secretary Marshall. Second. Second, Bird. Secretary Penny uh, makes a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will uh, call the roll. Okay, for the town, excuse me, town of Black Mountain, Marshall moves a penny second. Auditor Holmes? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Burns? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Butler? Aye. Councilwoman Hoffman? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Philbeck? Aye. Treasurer Falwell? Aye. That motion carries. Thank you, uh, Town of Tryon. Uh, without objection, we'll vote on those together. Okay. Um, this is Jennifer Wimmer. Um, attachment C is the Town of Tryon. Um, the, this entity um, has come to us, and actually, um, the fire truck purchase um, for the first. Uh, attachment that you have um, would fall under the UAL unit um, because of the vehicle purchase, but because it has a second water and sewer uh, SRF loan, we wanted to speak to everything together. So the first item is the fire truck, um, $852,459 for um, their borrowing uh, this uh, fire truck, it, the one they have, is reaching the end of the life uh, that is allowed to um, have it in service. And so they would like to replace that with the bank loan of uh, 15 years with Home Trust Bank for 4.99%. Um, second item 
that they are looking to um, go forth with is a uh, loan from Department of Environmental Quality, not to exceed amount of six hundred and twelve thousand three hundred and fifty-five dollars. Um, again, with the state of North Carolina, um, most of the actual project costs are um, coming from DEQ's forgivable loan and a DEQ grant. Um, so this is the uh, portion of the project that needs to be debt funding. So again, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kendra uh, to talk about the FPICs uh, globally for the town of Tryon. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so the town of Tryon um, is on the unit assistance list and has been since 2015. And most recently, um, the financial performance indicators um, of concern that they had and that helped them remain on the unit assistance list were related to internal controls. In the past, they'd had um, issues with their financial condition. Those seem to have been have improved and they did not um, have any concerns related to their their finances and their general fund and water and sewer fund this past fiscal year um, the things that are in were internal control issues were that they were late four out of the last five years um, and they had budget violations and identified some material weaknesses to to address these things um, the plant the units put together Together, a plan of action that consists of implementing some internal control best practices that are being put in place with their new town man by their new town manager, who is also a GFOA certified finance officer. Um, they have also, in addition, um, brought in a, a another a firm to assist them in the coordination of their annual audit. Um, they're working towards cross training their staff and adding some finance office staff to avoid any repeat findings. Um, another one of the financial performance indicators of concern that they had that was not part of the scoring for the um, unit assistance list, but was, was an issue, was their water sewer fund capital assets condition ratio. We'd like to see that number be at about 50%, theirs is at 32%. Um, and the conversation that we like to have with the unit is about what is their plan of action to address their aging infrastructure and the unit made sure that we knew that they do have a capital improvement plan that where they um, are addressing these things that that are um, their infrastructure and that's part of this this debt issuance is is going to be addressing that um, the infrastructure so we uh, um, anticipate that while when they are able to get these projects taken care of that that for financial performance indicator of concern will go away um, again that they didn't have any issues in their um, general fund or water and sewer fund so we're confident that this the financing for this fire truck and for the loan portion of this water and sewer project will not have a, a detrimental effect on their financial condition staff's recommendation is to do I hear a motion? Move to approve. Fill back. Thank you. Second. Second. Auditor Zephyr Holmes. Alter Holmes second. Any further discussion? And uh, I presume that motion is to be for both items, dead items together, correct? Mr. Philbeck and Alter Holmes? That was my understanding, yes, sir. Okay. Motion is being made in further discussion hearing none the clerk will call the roll okay for tryon both the fire truck on uh, installment purchase and water sewer state revolving fund loans phil beck holmes so secretary marshall aye thank you secretary penny aye mr burns aye mr butler aye councilwoman hoffman aye thank you and treasurer falwell aye now, attachment D, uh, Rowan County. Mr. Treasurer, point of inquiry, just wondering if uh, you, you said that we would put off my motion, and I'm happy to do that, but when do you expect that we will discuss that for the Cabarrus County? Probably just the next few minutes. Awesome. Yeah, Thank I, you, sir. Uh, I 
could have been a little more responsive, but I had no idea that you were going to make that motion. And nor did staff. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to give time. I just want to make sure that we were able to discuss it today. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. The courtesy of a call would have been appreciated. Okay. Rowan County. Um, Rowan County um, is attachment D um, that has been uh, pulled separately uh, for a comment that we received and it was in your packet. Um, Rowan County is coming um, for $73,000, not to $73 million, <laughs> if they wish, um, $73 million limited obligation bonds um, to construct um, a school and equipping uh, with roof uh, projects and um, a construction and equipping of an addition at an elementary school. Um, they have a not to exceed uh, amount of 4.75%, uh, 20 years. This is a public um, issuance negotiated public sale schedule for September 19th. Um, uh, and we have asked for enrollment numbers, and there um, should be a representative from the county available for any questions. Any questions? <coughs> Hearing none, do I, staff's recommendation is to approve. And do I hear a motion? I so move. Second. Second, Nancy Hoffman. Thank you. Woman Hoffman, motion second being made. Any further discussion? Mr. Treasurer, let me just ask just a simple question about that public comment. Are any of those questions things the staff ask or we ordinarily do, or is that just here simply because of our policy? Um, Mr. Philbeck, Ms. Jennifer, um, normally uh, we um, ask uh, at least about enrollment growth on the schools, um, but we um, have policy of letting the uh, commission have all the, the public comments of things that are on the agenda. So these were not anything that concerned the staff, I feel sure. Then. That is correct. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Motion uh, being made and second. Any further discussion? Hearing down the clerk of call roll. Rowan County borrowing limited obligation bonds of $73 million. Butler Hoffman. Auditor Holmes? Aye. Thank you. Secretary Marshall? Aye. Secretary Aye. And Mr. Burns? Aye. And Mr. Philbeck? Aye. Treasurer Falwell? Aye. Next is uh, attachments uh, E and F for Rural Hall in Morrisville. Uh, this board has dealt with situations in uh, Rural Hall. Which which communities are y'all from? Rural. Oh. <laughs> Thanks Should for being here. Welcomes you. I apologize. You know, my wise man taught me a long time ago: when you get what you want. Hush. <laughs> All you need is the back of their heads. <laughs> so, uh, Morrisville and Rural Hall, uh, and what do you want to say about this? Those two items, Treasurer, are um, to support information on the consent agenda. Rural Hall, the public comment um, was uh, an item that we provided to the town, and they addressed um, and so we felt and they felt confident bringing it um, to you after they addressed that comment. Okay. So again these are just to support two items that are on the consent agenda just for members information. Can, can you be a little more clear on that? I mean this seems to be a procedural complaint mostly it and sometimes there are policy discussions that we def definitely defer to the local unit but procedure issues bother me if there hadn't been appropriate notice. They conducted an investigation or reported to you all that all the procedures were appropriate. And I'd like them to confirm that for you, but we have talked with them. They went back and held another public hearing to ensure. Can we um, oh, call up the folks on Rural Hall to answer those questions, please? Let's 
we have um, we have uh, Mr. Dearman, the town manager, with us. Mr. Dearman, can you hear us? Good afternoon, members of the commission and staff. Homer Dearman here. Mr. Dearman, Secretary Marshall is asking about the comment that you received and how you address that concern. Yes, ma'am. I want to make sure that you all can hear me via the microphone. We can. Thank you. We did address the concern. There was a, um, we, we did advertise the hearing in the newspaper of general circulation. We also advertised it on the premises and on our social media venues. Uh, however, we did not at the time send a specific notice to members of the Sunshine List. Uh, when that complaint was brought to our attention by the LGC staff, we made a decision to re-advertise the hearing and hold a, 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 another hearing at our regular council meeting, which was advertised on our social media pages, on our website, to the Sunshine List, and in the newspaper again. Uh, we held, re held the hearing to make sure that uh, all procedural requirements were met. Uh, is it correct, though, that the town did not announce at the regular council meeting on the 8th that the special meeting was, the special public hearing was going to be on the 10th? The determination was not made to hold the special meeting until after the regular meeting that was held on the 8th. The, um, we did not have all of the uh, ducks in a row to be able to schedule the special meeting and to hold that meeting at that time. And that materialized in the days following the regular meeting um, held on the 8th. So no, it was not announced at that meeting and we are not aware of any requirement that it had to be announced at a, spe at a regular meeting. All right. that that's and just to clarify, the, the comment was that it wasn't announced in a regular meeting, but that requirement, Cindy confirmed, does not exist for that special meeting to be announced in the regular meeting. This is Cindy Aiken. I don't hold myself out as expert on municipal law procedure, but I my reading of the notice requirements was that particular sentence in the citizen's comment is, is irrelevant. That was not a requirement. Okay. But I, I agreed that they had a possible issue with the other one. So, okay. Secretary Alger Holmes. I understand that there may not have been a requirement, but my question is, was something not done that is normally done? So, for example, did they, was the notification procedure different from what the notification procedure would normally be? No, ma'am. We, we simply failed to notify the sunshine list which the complainant was the was the person who was on the sunshine list and so to make sure that we met all requirements we, we felt like it was necessary to go back and and redo it correctly okay thank you Is there thank you how much in advance of the meeting it would have to be if they didn't know it on the 8th held it on the 10th decided after the 8th to hold it there's not much time I, I have to go. This is Cindy again. I, I can go back and look that up. But my understanding, they they had a whole new meeting with uh, Mr. Dearman and his attorney uh, talked to us, and their plan was go exactly the way the statute requires. And they had a when did Mr. Dearman? When did you have the second 2.0 public hearing? 2.0 was in what date? August something, right? That would have been August the 12th, which was our regular council meeting in August. Okay, that's not. So they just had a whole so right. so that was never, fine. It's fine. like the first hearing never happened and they just rebooted and did it over. And sorry for Secretary Marsh, correct. This came in, we provided this as we do with all comments to the unit. They said, let us go back, make sure we did it right. They did it right and now they're back every day. Yeah. So. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, and the Morrisville project? That's just for information for members. Uh, this is a 3P, 3P project in Morrisville, Morrisville and uh, I'm not uh, typically a fan of uh, 3P projects, especially for communities that are 
rolling like that one is, but um, does anybody have any questions about the Marsville 3P project that's on the consent agenda? Mr. Treasurer, some um, representatives from the town are here with us today. Okay, good. And they are. Oh. Uh, why wasn't it on our summarized list like we normally do? It, Mr. It, Butler, it's on the, it's in what's in miscellaneous <coughs> items. It's, it's, it's in the consent agenda packet. A, it's a contract. And it falls under the LGC approval authority for contracts for the purchase, lease, and acquisition of capital which, assets. Which attachment is it? Attachment G, page G30. Page, I mean, yeah, attachment G, G, like G30. At the back page. I apologize, G33. Okay. I've got one if you need one. You can identify yourself. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Treasurer. Brandon Zudema, the town manager for the town of Morrisville. Can uh, all those that are joining us virtually uh, hear Brandon? Okay, good. All right. Uh, does, would you like just to give a couple of minutes and talk about this, please? Sure. Um, so this project is our town center project, which is to create a downtown that has never existed in Morrisville. Um, we have pursued this as a public-private partnership in order to ensure that the full build-out of the project could be realized in a way that we would not be able to do if we were not in a public-private partnership. Uh, so the town has spent a number of years acquiring property in this area, also making other preparations in terms of stormwater and, and other uh, opportunities that would be necessary for this to happen. Um, we issued an RFP. We have been working with the Development Finance Initiative at the UNC School of Government. Uh, Eric Thomas with that organization is here to support us as well. And so we issued an RFP back in 2020. Uh, and we had three uh, interested parties in response to that. Our count council ultimately selected Singh Development LLC. Uh, they're a Michigan-based company, but they have offices in Cary, uh, which is a, a stone's throw where they are uh, from Morrisville. They're also a local company uh, that has family that lives in the area and that we are working directly with. So we initially signed an MOU with them that we would begin to work towards the development of this project. Uh, it's currently approximately a 12-acre project that will bring a town green along with an amphitheater uh, to the town. It'll expand our facilities <coughs> related to our ability to host a farmer's market that is there along with town special events in that area. Uh, it'll also include a multifamily structure along with uh, commercial and retail on one of the main streets, and then also what's called cottage retail, smaller boutique type area uh, within the park. All of that which is intended to activate the space and to give our residents and visitors a place to come to Morrisville and experience some of what uh, our, our small town in a still growing uh, community would feel like. And what's the total cost of the project? Total estimate right now, sir, is approximately $105 million. Um, and approximately 19 of that is the town investment. The remainder is investment by our partner, Singh Development. I can I ask you, what is the developer's fee for this? So we are paying them a 4% fee to manage the project. So That's $4 million. And you said it was over $100 million. How, much, how much money is it? So we, we are paying them approximately $726,000 uh, to manage the, the project in terms of the construction administration um, so that we, we had that discussion with them. And rather than do two separate projects where we would manage ours and they would manage theirs, this brings efficiencies to that project. We think probably saves that much or more in not having to have uh, competing interests and not having to have two project managers that might want to do something similar at the same time but not be coordinated. Um, so we have worked through that. We've, we've examined and discussed that concept with DFI. Uh, they've been supportive of that. And the 4% has been found to be a, a fair market rate for that work. Is this seven hundred thousand dollars you're gonna pay them? Yes, sir. On how much of the project cost? Seven hundred and twenty six on what is our nineteen million dollar approximate investment. It's four percent of that. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for coming in. Just on terms of transparency, conflicts of interest, and 
good governance. Could you briefly address those three things? Those are things that we ask about a lot when it comes to 3P partnerships. Yes, sir. So in terms of conflict of interest, um, not aware of anything in that regard. Um, I also have our assistant town attorney who has been uh, a key part of this, Lori Jones. I may ask her to join me up here in case she has any other thoughts beyond mine, Mr. Treasurer. Um, so in terms of conflict of interest, you know, this is a partnership. Uh, we do not have any council members that have any interest in anything that would be occurring here. No property ownership, no other interest in Singh development or anything else that would generate a conflict of interest in that regard. In terms of governance, I would argue that this is good governance on the part of the town and our council in the sense that it's going to provide amenities and, and again, really a downtown that has not existed previously and that I don't believe we can construct on our own. Uh, we're not developers. We would not be able to have the control over what goes there like we do with the uh, development of the P3. So with that, we have worked with the, uh, the applicant, our partner, saying uh, in January of this year, our council uh, adopted rezoning of that area to a Main Street uh, plan development district, which is very specific to what the council's vision is for that area. Uh, that vision has been formalized since about 2007 when they adopted their first town center plan. And so the six core components of that are still the same today and is focused around bringing uh, a gathering place to Morrisville uh, to give our residents again a place to come and really have a place when you think of Morrisville you think of the town center, you think of coming there for shows, you think of coming there for events and for activities. Thank you. Did I answer your question, sir? Yeah. And there's no housing involved in this? There is multifamily apartments in this, yes, sir. Uh, what about the percentage or number of affordable houses? So there is no specific allotment for affordable housing in this. Uh, what they, what Singh instead is doing is including some smaller units that will be fairly priced for the market. And do, do you, if you don't mind, do you have as a policy in your in Morrisville for a percentage or of the number of units being built, so many of them be in affordable housing or work for, workforce housing? Do you, do you have a town policy that addresses that? We currently do not have a policy that addresses a specific requirement, sir. Okay. Mrs. Jones, welcome. Uh, and just talk a little bit about conflicts and transparency, opposition to the project, if you could. Yes, so I will reiterate what Mr. Sudama said, um, that this was put out to bid, so there was a whole RFP process. Um, so Singh was chosen from that. Um, there have been, as far as transparency goes with citizenship, numerous meetings from prior to that occurring to date um, where Singh has come in to make presentations to the town council um, so that they are aware of the status of the project, the different ideas that are going on. Um, there have been events that have taken place within the town of Morrisville where staff have been available to discuss this project. Um, and I believe you'll have to confirm the Singh representatives have been present for those as well. They have been a part of some of those, Mr. Treasurer. Additionally, if I could, I would argue, or excuse me, I would offer that we have uh, hosted several meetings. We've done that at like National Night Out where people were coming for a reason, but we knew there'd be a lot of people there to be able to discuss this. Uh, we have held meetings specific to this for the public to attend both in person and virtually. Um, and then we continue to work currently uh, with the one neighborhood that's immediately adjacent uh, to address any concerns they have, to share with them the, the why behind what we're doing and how it will function, uh, to address their concerns related to parking and noise as well. Okay. Public Thank hearings, you. let me just add, the, the required public hearings have taken place. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, vote on the consent agenda, then we'll go to Mr. Burns. Uh, is there any other questions regarding this 3P project from, on Morrisville? In layman terms, how is the money going to be paid back? So we have several methods by which we're uh, covering that. So we have approximately 13 or $13.5 <clears throat> million dollars in bonds that will be utilized. Uh, we also have some PPIL parks payment in lieu funds that will be used for that. Uh, we'll also be using some general fund monies, uh, reserves to capital reserves, excuse me, not general fund, capital reserves to also fund the project, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm uh, Alter Holmes. And by the way, if you have a question, just 
do like that <laughs> so we can see. All right, go ahead. Uh, I will certainly uh, do that moving forward. Um, but first, I'd like to commend uh, the town for bringing us a very thorough proposal. I would like to follow up on uh, Mr. Butler's comments regarding um, affordable housing and uh, would ask that the town officials reconsider uh, the inclusion of workforce housing in their multi-family housing on this project. So I think that we can certainly have that discussion. Uh, I think that is more likely to come potentially in a future phase. Um, so I didn't address that, but this is phase one of what's likely to be a two or three phase project. Again, we're doing approximately 12 acres now. The full project is anticipated to be about 25 acres. So again, at least one more, if not two more phases to follow. We do anticipate additional residential in one or both of those phases. And I think we have a better opportunity there. I think, um, Auditor Holmes, the challenge we have is that we're, we're building from the ground up. And so in terms of working with our partner and finding a way to get this funded, not only on our side, but also on their side, um, is, is a bit of a challenge. We, we need to ensure that we are getting the retail components filled to activate this. And so once we can do that with phase one, I believe we stand a stronger chance to include affordable housing in phase two and or phase three. Thank you for your response. I do know that Western Wake is growing very rapidly, uh, but in terms of thinking about workforce housing, again, it's something that I think you ought to be thoughtful regarding at the front end as opposed to the labor. So I just ask that you all keep that in mind that there are you know, educators and uh, government workers, et cetera, that cannot afford to uh, live and work in more still and it would be ideal for the town to be thoughtful about that on the front. I appreciate that. Um, my last comment I would offer is we are, as a town, working on an affordable housing, housing program or plan. Uh, we're currently working with Habitat for Humanity on the possibility of donating some land to construct some things there. We're also looking at some rental assistance programs to support workforce housing, uh, particularly for our own staff and for educators in the community. And we are working to include affordable housing in some of the private development that's occurring. As a matter of fact, we have an item on the agenda tonight um, that our council has pushed back and, and seen increases in the affordable housing that would occur there as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That all sounds great. Um, just know that I will be following this particular project um, as to whether workforce housing is included with this particular project. So thank you. Any other questions or concerns? Uh, I have one on this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. If we're through with this one. We are. Okay. <clears throat> on page 13 under Moorhead City, <clears throat> back a couple weeks ago, and Cabarrus is here, um, there was conversation about half a courthouse and half partial things and what have you, and I got to thinking about that, and because I've been on the council a long time, and I just don't remember that conversation before, and I see here for Moorhead City, this is for a partial construction of a new fireplace. Uh, what does that really mean? Another half a fireplace? <laughs> I think it was partial. We'll just pull that. I think that's partial funding towards the fire. Right. So if you see the sources on um, page G14, um, they did get a grant from um, through um, OSBM. And so that came through state appropriations so to for for this. So it's partial funding. We just wanted to make sure that okay. was it was four like, four and four nine four like the partial whole thing. Partial construction of a fire station. I think so Secretary Marshall, we actually tried to clarify that because at first we said that the proceeds would be used to construct the fire station. We wanted to make it clear that the 4.9 wasn't the total cost. Right. But I think partial was placed probably in the wrong position <laughs> in the sentence. Right. And so it's partial partial, fun. partial financing towards full construction. Yes. So okay. that, that's a grammar error, not a financing error. Well, <laughs> I try to follow them, and they get hard after a while, and then something come back and bite you. And you what It'll only fight partial fires, Madam Secretary. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, any other 
questions about the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve of the consent agenda, Chapel Hill through miscellaneous action items ending with Transylvania County. Move, Move approval, Burns. Second. Uh, Mr. Burns first, uh, Secretary Penny second. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. And Secretary Marshall, I'm just so embarrassed because Debbie should, we are both are because we're like the grammar hawks. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I'm the last one to catch spelling. <laughs> this grammar place, will catch me once in a while. That misplaced modifier. All right, back to the business at hand. Consent agenda, Chapel Hill through Transylvania County, Burns Penny. Auditor Holmes. Aye. Uh -huh. Thank you. Secretary Marshall. Aye. Penny. Mr. Butler. Aye. Thank you. The Councilwoman Hoffman. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Philbeck? Aye. Treasurer Caldwell? Aye. Thank you. The motion carried. All right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burns uh, brought up a few moments. Thank you all for. Thank you for your time. Appreciate you. Uh, Alter, uh, Mr. Burns brought up the need to place on the agenda and or discuss the issue about uh, Cabarrus County and the building not being on today's agenda. Uh, Mr. Burns, I'd like for staff to respond to why that is. And you can, obviously, you uh, have thought through this and had discussions, so I'd like for you to be open to what the staff's getting ready to tell you. I'm, I'm always open to the staff, Mr. Treasurer. I just want to say, um, in response to your, your statement earlier, that a call would have been appreciated. I, I do apologize for not doing that. This is my first day back at work after a medical leave, um, and so I have not been able to follow up as much as I would like to. I was just surprised not to see it on the agenda, and um, I'm happy to listen to staff and, and always want to hear what they have to say. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Burns, a little bit of background so as I'm sure members are aware but just for background what staff does when we receive applications is review them and make an analysis as to whether or not that application fills, fulfills the findings that are required in order for the Commission to approve um, an application uh, in this particular case this financing falls under article um, 8 of um, chapter 159 it's a it's a contract or other financing and so basically and staff is looking to recommend do our analysis and recommend to commission members whether or not those specific findings are met for each specific type of financing that's being um, essentially a, 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 that your approval is being requested for in this case um, we look at a couple things one is that the sums the Basically, the amount is adequate, not excessive, uh, that debt management pr uh, procedures are, are good. And if you look at your debt sheets, again, for just as background, when we do the, each of these sheets that come to you when an item is on the agenda actually lists those findings, and, that, and staff will check those off as we make them. Again, this isn't our finding to make, but yours. We're just doing the analysis and obviously in the background as staff for you, and we're making our recommendation as to whether or not those findings are met. Um, in the case of, of this application, staff could not conclude that the adequate but not excessive finding was met. Um, and so that's why um, we recommended um, that this not be included because we had several, we had concerns um, most specifically around that finding and that we could not recommend to commission members that that finding was met. The, that as background as far as our process goes. Auditor, and I'm happy. Auditor Holmes was waving her hand, Secret, uh, Mr. Treasurer, and okay. I think. Auditor Holmes, you wanted to go through well. the second point or you want to ask your question now? Oh, and now if it's okay, I would like additional clarification around uh, the concern and um, of the specific finding and whether this is something that we should uh, discuss Further and also, uh, if it's not on this particular agenda, would the plan then be to put it on next month's agenda? And, um, Auditor Holmes, I'd be happy to go through the specific reason, absolutely, that we came to that conclusion. Um, the and again, a, a little bit of background on the project in, in broad terms. 
this the the application is for the purchase of essentially three buildings and excess land and then on top of the excess land another building would be built so this this encompasses a lot of parts our concern though focused on the purchase price for what is called the quote ACN building although Quite honestly, the ACN quote building is actually three buildings. Um, it's the corporate building at 1000 Progress Place and two other buildings, um, five, uh, 940 and 9, 920, and 9, 920 and 940 Progress Place, so 950 Progress Place. So just to be clear, when we say the ACN building purchase, we are talking about the actual three buildings, the land um, and the excess land. The county entered into a contract for purchase of uh, at $42 million. The county uh, tax valuation completed or, or reported in January of this year was $22.9 million. Um, the market value appraisal was for the buildings and the land that was completed in February of 2024 was for $23.8 million. So the contract was for $42 million. The county's tax valuation in January of 24 was for $22.9 million. The market value appraisal was <coughs> $23.8 million. The county provided to us in their application a replacement cost analysis of $54 million. Um, the replacement cost analysis isn't something that typically is used by LGC staff and applications to support um, a contract price, and um, it did not take into account at all depreciation of, in, in the value of those buildings. Um, the buildings are approximately 30 years old, um, so the purchase price of or the contract price that the county had of $42 million would also require 20, uh, an estimated uh, $20 million in repairs. So that total would be $62 million to purchase that building and do the repairs. Although, um, again, staff had concerns about that $20 million number and whether that would be adequate given the, the, con the concerns of um, the, the, the status of the building. So LG, based on the $22.9 million tax valuation, um, the $23.8 million appraisal, LGC staff could not conclude that the $42 million plus the $20 million in repairs was adequate and not excessive. I will note as well that the the evaluate the market appraisal of $23 million was only provided to us in the end of August when we asked about the method that evaluation used. Again, it was a repla the, 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 the $54 million estimate, value estimate that was provided by the county <coughs> was based on replacement cost analysis with no depreciation. We were not aware and were not told until we asked in the end of August if there was why there, they used that approach and not market uh, market value appraisal. And so we also had concerns that that information wasn't provided with their application. I, I, I certainly thank you for that explanation. I certainly understand. Mr. Penny's got the floor, and Mr. Burns, I'll come back to you. Right, I'm sorry. Ed. I certainly understand your concerns based upon what you've explained to us. And, and, and I'm, my concern is more um, philosophical than it is, because I'm not getting to the substance of this transaction. Uh, the substance of this transaction, I understand what you what you just said, and 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 they're going to have to explain these different numbers. But there there are always two issues here: whether something should be on the agenda, and whether something should be approved. And your statements go to whether it should be approved, not whether it should be on the agenda. Um, uh, because you are looking at not whether the, it, they fulfill the requirements to be approved. 
you are looking at whether they fulfill the requirements to be considered. And once they fulfill the requirements to be considered, they should then come to us. At that point, you then can, and I'm, please don't take this personally, I'm saying staff, then should then say, we're not recommending this because all these numbers aren't, ma aren't matching up uh, here. But we, we are denying the commission and there is nothing in the statute. In fact, the statute clearly says the commission must make these decisions. And the only exception to that is the executive committee. All right? And so you're denying the commission the right to vote on it when they have given us all the data. Because at this point, the only way this thing gets on the Based on what I'm hearing, the only way this thing gets on the agenda is if that contract gets changed. Because at this point, their numbers are just out of whack, is what, what you're saying. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, for Cabarrus County, I'm not saying she's right. I'm not taking her side either. I'm just saying what I'm hearing is the numbers are out of whack. And, and so what I, am, what I am saying is they deserve a right to be on the agenda. Now, they don't necessarily, they don't have a right to be approved, but they have a right to be on the agenda and be heard uh, because they've, they've given all the information necessary to decide. Now, that information may lead to a negative decision, but they have given all the information necessary to decide. And again, I... The statute gives that authority to the commission and no, no one individual and not to the staff. And, and so I think we put ourselves in a precarious position when we deny people access to an opportunity to be heard, the, the minimums of due process. I think we put ourselves in a precarious position when we deny them that, when they've done the things that they, they, they have, they, they've done. Now, again, that does not speak to should this thing be approved. Now, may I speak? Or uh, Mr. John Burns, next? Go ahead, uh, Mr. Butler, Mr. Burns has I hand know, up. I'm sorry. Mr. Burns, Bob, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I echo Secretary Penny's comments, and I, I just wanted to note that when things are held off the agenda, um, there, there's no opportunity for us to consider, vote, or approve those things, but it amounts to an effective denial of the application when and if the application is time sensitive. And it, this has happened before since I've come on the board. Um, if, if you've got a time sensitive application, there's a contract date, a closing date, something like that, holding it off the agenda effectively kills it without the commission being able to vote. And I think that's highly um, problematic, and, and I agree with Secretary Penny. It sets it sets the commission up for um, it just puts us in a very legally, I think, precarious position. So I, I just wanted to make sure that we have the opportunity to discuss this and vote it up or down um, without it just being a decision by by uh, one person or staff who do a phenomenal, monumental job. Please, there's no criticism here of staff. It's what what standard is being applied. I would much rather um, the staff work with applicants to get the completed application and then make your recommendation to us once it's on the agenda, whether you recommend approval or not. And then it's on us as appointees or as or the members of the Council of State or the governor's, count, governor's cabinet who are on this board to make the actual decisions because by the statute, that's who should be making it. Um, so that I, I'd like to make sure that we have this, this, doc, this application before us um, in a timely manner, whether that's this month or, or next month, if that's even even procedurally possible. Um, Mr. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet, let Mr. Butler talk now, as I always should. Uh, we're gonna let uh, Ms. Tomasco respond to that, and then Jennifer, if she has anything to add, then we'll go to Mr. Butler. I did just wanna clarify that the, 
if we have concerns or issues like this, we do go back to the unit, and, and that is the, the process. It's not necessarily that we just don't like how something's falling out, and we, and again, we don't say what's on the agenda or not the agenda, and it, we're very clear that this is always the commission's vote and the commission's determination. <coughs> but in this case, because of the late date with which when we received this uh, $23 million appraisal. Again, the application's been in for a while. We never received the $20 million, $23 million appraisal until August, I believe, 30th. We did not have time at that point to circle back, talk to the unit about the concerns, go through everything we've discovered since then in order to have a, in order to be ready to have the application on this agenda. So it wasn't that we were in any way trying to step in front of the commission and de facto make a decision and, and, and for the commission, but that we did not have time, again, because of the very late date that we received this information about the appraisal, to go back. And again, th this does happen. This happens with other units. Of concerns come up. Jennifer and her great staff will go back and work with units let them know what concerns are because we believe they might not meet the findings or we have other concerns and they'll work with those units iteratively to address concerns, make sure the financings are in, are, are, are in good shape so that we can bring them and present them to, to the commission for a vote. So I did not mean to imply at all that we were, we had made this decision or were withholding it, just that we did not have time, again, given with this late information to be able to bring the application to you. And just let me, I know, I want to say I, my comments were not directed at state. <laughs> you all do a great job and, and, I, and I certainly understand. I mean, I, I got the 900 pages last night and no, I'm not ready to vote because uh, I haven't read it. So I, I no, please, I apologize. If, no, not at all. And I, I want to, since that was in response to my point, I just would like to, to follow up, Mr. Treasurer, if that's okay, and then I'll defer. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that explanation, and again, no no criticism towards staff. I, if I worded it that way, please don't read it what I said that way. But I um, I do understand, though, that that the issue here is the, the, the submission of the appraisal. Um, is there a requirement that a county have an appraisal of property before purchasing it? in statute or otherwise? In general, I'll let Jennifer answer that one, but we can also talk to the timing of, of what we received. So in so general. In, in general, um, we have always asked for some sort of documentation to try to uphold the adequate but not excessive finding. And normally uh, with a land or building purchase, that is the one way that most units um, have decided to have that documentation uh, submitted to us. Um, if it's not, we usually ask for it because that's um, one global uh, piece of information that everybody can um, review and understand that that's um, the documentation for that finding. Um, so in the past, we have always asked for that. Um, and again, just to um, go along with Debbie's comments, um, the application for this particular transaction was received the afternoon of August 6th, which was the deadline for the September agenda. And so when we started looking through that, we had questions and we followed up um, several times um, asking for more information because of things that had come up that we still had questions on. And as um, Secretary Tomasco has said, um, the final piece that we were really waiting on to, you know, get it to review it came in August 30th. So there was some more things that we would like to review and discuss. So, um, but to answer your question on the appraisal, yes, um, I don't know if it's specifically in statute, but we always ask for documentation as well as that information is on the application that anything that would be um, imperative to make those findings be included in the application. And at the, the time that it was submitted, it was not. Mr. Butler. Thank you. My comments were that, as Debbie said, it's their job to get everything ready to come to us, and she it just hadn't 
hadn't come all together, and I just wanted to point that out. That it, uh, I want them to get everything together before it comes to us, and not be left hanging out there, un, uh, and we haven't realized it. As if I can comment about the uh, getting appraisals, uh, <coughs> that has been a key issue on some projects here before this board. Very key issues about what the appraisal number was and what something would sell for. So that, this, this is this is not new to us for the first time. So uh, since none of that criticism is directed at staff, Ms. Ms. Hoffman, go ahead. Yes. So, so it, is it possible then that this could be on the October agenda? Yeah, we will. Uh, Ms. Hoffman, we are going to continue to review this. Uh, obviously, there's a lot going on in Cabarrus County, and uh, this uh, market appraisal that came in was on a weekend, Labor Day, a week ago. And uh, that was new information to me, uh, period. And I'm fully confident that the staff will be able to get their due diligence done, assuming there's no thing else that keeps coming up out of Cabarrus County uh, for the October agenda. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. I know, I know. Alder Holmes. And then Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my, my first question is just a point of clarification regarding uh, did the county fail to provide required information when they submitted their application and therefore had an incomplete application? Auditor Holmes, yes. Um, there was some information that is um, on the agenda, um, or excuse me, on the application packet that we had to request after it came in. So technically on the due date, there were some items that were on the application that were missing. Got it, I've distinguished, uh, I'm just trying to distinguish between on the application as opposed to uh, statutorily required. I, um, Auditor Holmes, I don't know that the statute speak to the contents of an application or the requirements of the contents of an application. Um, it's again, the supporting documentation that, L that staff is requiring a request, I should say requesting in order to help us perform our analysis and determine if those, we can recommend that those findings are met. I think that application form, I hate to say it, it's how old, Jennifer? It's well. I mean, it's been around for probably decades. Literally, yes. the amount of in, the information that's requested on that application, that application form, for for better or for worse, hasn't really changed in, in, in quite a long time. So, uh, well, uh, I would I would note that it may be reasonable for us to reassess what needs to be included on that application as opposed to what doesn't. Um, if the numbers are as out of whack as was mentioned, then I look forward to the discussion and it will probably be a very short discussion. But I would like the opportunity to hear directly from the county as to what the rationale is or what their uh, logic or lack thereof is regarding the purchase price, the contract price, um, to uh, follow up on Ms. Hoffman's question of is this something that can be accomplished at the next at the next meeting or, or what would be the challenges to prevent that from happening and giving us the opportunity to ask a uh, county official about these discrepancies as i responded to mrs hoffman there's absent any new additional information which we continue to receive uh, i don't see any reason why the staff cannot complete its review of this application by the October meeting. Uh, and as I was getting ready to say a few moments ago, if all this criticism is not directed to staff, then it's directed as me as chair. So if that's the case, just say that. It's fine. Uh, okay. But the fact, the, the fact is, is that uh, 
if if you look at the responsibilities of the local government commission, the protocol and procedures that have been used and deference toward the chair of the local government commission for decades to set the agenda. We're doing the best we possibly can with what we have, with what we're, the information we're getting to meet the needs of these applicants, period. And uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I will personally respond uh, to that. Um, I appreciate staff's uh, response and the response uh, is logical to me as to why it wasn't on this particular agenda. Uh, but I assure you that if I thought differently, I would certainly uh, be very uh, forward and straightforward about that. And so just on, on my end, um, I appreciate staff's recommendation. It makes sense to me. Um, and if I, if I thought otherwise, I would certainly welcome it. Sure. And I, and I would agree. I mean, given the timing and other things, uh, nobody's asking them to, 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 to bend over backwards and, and do do that which which really probably can't be done uh it, it just it would be inappropriate to do that i i guess i have one question that i the deficiencies that were in the application have they been corrected whether it was a good correction or a bad correction have they been corrected is the information there whether we like the information or not is it there? Um, Secretary Penny, I'm honestly not sure because the information that we received late, we weren't aware was missing from the application to start with. So the application was provided to us with the $54 million replacement cost analysis. It did not include the $23 million market value appraisal. And only at in our last round of questions when we asked for for an explanation as to why that methodology was used as opposed to why they used replacement cost and, um, analysis rather than market value appraisal. That is when they mentioned they had it and gave us that report that was actually a re report dated February 5th. But we have enough information now. I mean, is it, correct I, me. We I, have I, enough okay. information to make the decision whether up or down. I, I, be, I believe so, Secretary Penny, as, as long as we, again, I, I thought the application was complete before, and so if we assume at this point, that to Treasurer's point, that we know everything and nothing else comes in, we certainly are ready to, staff would be able to review it in time for the October agenda. And, and just a quick note as well that there is a, a, there's been on October uh, 30th, while we were still reviewing this application, I apologize. On August 30th, while we're reviewing this application, the county did submit another application that they're asking to have on the October agenda is as that well. For the school. That is a, a limited obligation bond ban program for no limited obligation bonds. Thank you. Um, and at about 150 million. Yes. About 150 million dollars in limited obligation bonds to be placed on the October. Um, is that application complete? We, uh, quite honestly, sir, we have been focusing on this you, to get ready for this meeting, and we'll, we're, we'll begin, we've only begun a review of that. So, so, so you, 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 you know, a, well, never mind. I'll, I'll stop. Treasure. Uh, let me get Secretary Marshall and uh, Mr. Philback, you're next after Secretary Marshall, please. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, we've had a lot of discussion here, and there are people here from Cabarrus County, and I unfortunately have understood how what we say here gets used to advantage or disadvantage back in the county, and I find it that we probably ought to hear from the people from Cabarrus County regarding some of the things that have been said here, because it's just like having uh, a one-sided trial or so, you know, conversation like that, and... Uh, Having experienced how what happens gets used, I think it should, by fairness, allow them to speak. I actually haven't said anything, but Mr. Philback, and then Ms. Ma uh, Alder Holmes after that, and then Mr. Philback, Mr. Butler, and Alder Holmes. Go ahead. 
So after one of our recent meetings, when it came to light from Secretary Marshall that she had been disparaged by a comment made by a citizen of Cabarrus County, I decided to go back and watch their meetings, which they have on their YouTube channel. And I found that meeting and correct that she had been called corrupt by a citizen. I believe the chairman was here at that you all at that meeting and he apologized for that but it just spurred me to watch it so i watched their august meeting too and there was the public apparently there at least someone had done a foia request and found out about this appraisal because i heard about it on the august 19th meeting i think that's when it was and there was an explanation given by the chairman and and about why they still felt it was best in light of that appraisal uh, being much less. And I think to Secretary Marshall's point, we ought to hear them whether now or at the next meeting. Only in the last two or three days have I started getting emails and at least one phone call, I think two, but one of them I hadn't talked back to yet. But there's a big concern in Cabarrus County by the folks who live in the vicinity of this, I believe it's called Coal Train School Project that they want on next month's agenda. Citizens that have emailed all of us, I think, and the caller to I've had, at least the one I talked to, they're as concerned that we get the school thing on October as anything because it's also time sensitive. So uh, I don't have any objection to having them both on October, but I do think they deserve an up or down vote on both of these. And I'll reserve any comments not to spring it out, but I have learned more about Cabarrus County politics than I ever wanted to know. Amen. Mr. Butler. I just want to bring to it. We meet 20 days from now, just in consideration for the staff. We meet October the 1st. So it's just, it's extended for us. It's short time frame. It's, that's a that's a lot of hay to load on the wagon in the next 20 days. Okay. Yes, Cindy. Cindy, <clears throat> Cindy Aiken speaking. If you all want some clarification on what the statutory requirements are for the application, I will briefly tell you. Um, oh, get to the right page. The application. The application shall state such facts and have attached to it such documents concerning the proposed contract and the financial condition of the contracting unit as the secretary may require. The commission may prescribe the form of the application. Now, I was, I was trying to pull up what our application, because I haven't looked at it, as to whether appraisal is listed or some form of, as Jennifer earlier said, some form of documentation supporting the quote adequate but not excessive before he accepts the application the secretary may require a preliminary conference and then um, one of our administrative rules which is the same as a law the secretary la, la, la. all of the applications shall be reviewed by staff for completeness and responsiveness to the statutory requirements the secretary may require such additional information as he may deem necessary. The secretary may request additional information. Um, and the commission, you all, of course, may, uh, blah, 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 wait a minute, may request additional information from any person or agency that you deem necessary to make your decision. And we've talked about this before a few times. So um, it's pretty much wide open <laughs> for whatever is deemed relevant, necessary to help make your decision. So, Treasurer, the application does indicate the application um, number 11, number um, 11L, as in uh, Larry, uh, does require an independent appraiser's report, if applicable, if that auditor home circles back to any of your questions about the appraisal or what needs to be included. As far as I understand the timeline, the contract was signed June of 2023 and the appraiser and 
I, again, I don't know what, how the county was thinking about how they were going to finance it because this this commission does not approve contracts to purchase property. The commission is approving fine debt. So if they're going into debt to buy something, that's why you're looking at it. And the appraiser was appraisal was not initiated until January of 2024. February was the one that has the market value, which we were not given with the application. And then March the, is the date of the second one called the replacement cost appraisal. Just to get that timeline. Okay. That's My all. druthers as chair would be to uh, put both of these items on separately on the October agenda. Barring any new information that is significant as an appraisal that they've that the county's had according to our legal counsel since February, we got a week before Labor Day uh, to have both of these on the October agenda, but voted on separately. If we need that as a motion, I'm happy to do so. I would, be, I would be happy to second that motion. Motion a second. Any further discussion? Yes, yes sir, Mr. Burns. I'm sorry. Just to follow up on, on Secretary Marshall's suggestion that um, the folks from the county may want to respond on some things so we have a full understanding of the, their application status. But um, I, I'll i withdraw my earlier motion since it didn't get a second, and I'm happy to proceed on this one, but, but did want to see if there was going to be an opportunity for them to comment. And could someone restate the motion for me? It's a motion that both <clears throat> items appear voted on separately on the October agenda. There were no two, two applications. One application for the ACN property for forty-two million. Well, that entire, just to be clear, the entire application. It was a the, the, that oh. application was for the ACN buildings, the excess oh, land, it. and the funds to uh, oh, yeah. the yeah. additional funds for the behavioral health building and will that include the school no, no that's, that's a separate application and, that's a separate and, and, that, and that's that was that's two separate, separate applications and will that be in our that's, that's the second, that's the second application one, correct right. yes sorry my fault yeah right. so acn property application number one includes. there's been three yeah so one we took care of behavioral health no so the motion is to vote on both of those applications yes uh, ne next next Wait. And, and secretary we, went, we only have two applications in front of us at this point so the motion was think to vote both which, oh, bad, that's fine. Yes. Question. which one is the behavioral health construction the on? acn building includes the excess land to build the building on, on as well as funds towards that building and then the second one quite honestly i haven't looked at the project list it's it but it includes the school that is being referenced. Right. So, right. so we have a motion to the two pending applications on October agenda to be treated as two se separate. Okay. And that was Hoffman Holmes. All right. Any okay. right. further discussion? Are we going to hear from the people from Cabarrus County that apparently are there? I well, think that would be appropriate as well. Uh, I, I, that's well, I mean, we can do it after we vote, or if they don't want to speak, they don't have to. But I, I would be happy to hear from them if they'd like to speak. Okay. Likewise, other just the whole. Uh, um, I was not aware they were coming, so we will we will we will call an audible and deal with this. Okay, as far as letting them speak if they choose to speak or having them speak when the, the matter comes up in the next meeting. So. What is the person that made the motion? What is your preference to vote on the motion and allowing them to speak, which is perfectly fine with me. As long as they speak, is that what the board cares about? That, that would meet my, I, I, I would say that I, I do think their comments to, to, to circle back to your point, Mr. Mr. Treasurer, their comments shouldn't be on the merits of the application or anything like that, but just as in response to, um, some of the situation that was discussed uh, in this discussion. That's all. Okay, I don't, all right. That might involve the merits of the application. <laughs> My preference is to vote on the motion and then 
extend the hospitality for them to speak and answer or address any issues. And that's fine with me. Okay. Any further discussion? I'm sorry, Alter Holmes. Um, I would support your request as well. Okay. Uh, motion being second, no further discussion. Hearing no further discussion, the clerk will call the roll. All right. Bears County, two applications to be considered separately on the October meeting. Hoffman Holmes. Secretary Marshall. Aye. Thank you. Secretary Penny. Can I have some discussion? Nope. No. <laughs> I, I just messed with, mess with, mess with the treasurer. <laughs> All right. Stop it. Stop it. No. <laughs> okay, Penny. Mr. Burns. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Butler. Aye. Right. Uh, whoops. Mr. Philbeck. Aye. Thank you. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. All right. Motion carries. Okay. October it is. The board wishes to extend the courtesy to the folks who are joining us from Cabarrus County to see if they'd like to say anything now or uh, when this becomes an official agenda item in October. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. I'm Steve Morris, Chairman of the Board of Commissioners in Cabarrus County. I uh, want to express appreciation for the, the action that, that you've taken today to place these two items on the agenda uh, for the October meeting. Um, I think you previously mentioned not talking about the merits of either application, uh, so I will attempt not to do that. Uh, regarding the, the questions that have been raised here today about the completeness of the ap application, uh, it was my impression and, and of course, I will have to go back and verify uh, with with staff that the uh, appraisal that was indicated that was not received until August the 30th, which was included on a, a list of questions that we received. Uh, at the time, I raised the question. I thought that had already been done, and the answer that I received was it has, but we're going to send it again. So we need to go back and clarify that. I think the other items that were missing from the uh, uh, application that were listed on the questions that staff sent to us uh, regarded um, certified minutes of the public hearing, uh, which at that point in time, those minutes had not been approved by the board. So I think that was the reason that, that those were not included. Uh, unit attorney's opinion, which I think is a letter from, from our attorney, which, which, which was, uh, was added to it. So I, th I think these were relatively minor uh, oversights that, that hopefully have all been corrected to the best of our knowledge they have. Uh, we responded promptly to the staff's list of questions, which were several pages. Um, uh, a follow-up to that was a request from staff for all uh, emails from staff members, managers, deputy managers, assistant managers for a period of uh, uh, January 1st through March the 30th of 2024. I think those were promptly uh, sent. Uh, partially because we had them uh, ready, because we received the same FOIA request from a citizen a few days prior to that, so it was easy for us to, to get that information together. Uh, once again, uh, thank you for your, your consideration, your action today, and I'm certainly happy to answer any, any questions that, that anybody might have. Questions? Uh, Hearing, hearing no questions, uh, I want to say that when we receive information into this office, especially in the era that we're in, we have a responsibility to trust but verify. So any request that may have come from staff uh, is the result of trying to verify some other information that they have and to have that officially come from you to us without any filters. And that was 
the purpose of that. Was that correctly stated? Okay. Certainly happy to comply with, with that request or, or any future ones uh, that you may have. Any further questions for the county manager? County okay. chair. Excuse me, chair. Hearing none. Okay. Thank you. Uh, make sure uh, everybody who was in attendance signs in. And just to remind folks that uh, the housekeeping items that Cindy mentioned at the start of our meeting regarding a public meeting. Uh, Everybody's aware of what she was talking about. <clears throat> With that, let's uh, get through to uh, Burn. Mr. Burns, anything else you want to put on the agenda? Uh, that, I guess that would depend, but I had nothing I've thought about, so okay. no, sir. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We'll go to uh, no votes necessary, but we'll go through to unit updates. Attachment H. Um, okay, let me stop. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, that was. We, this staff is spending a tremendous amount of time on Cliffside Sanitary District, on Eureka, and it's like in so many different situations. Anytime you look at a piece of paper, there's two sides to every story. And I'm fully confident. And I'm saying this as dramatically as I can because I want this to sink in. <clears throat> that when staff says they've responded, they ask people to do things that we've heard cricket since, that you believe them <laughs> because that is the truth. And as you hear about Cliffside Sanitary District in Eureka, I want your eyes may gloss over because you have are thinking to yourself, we've, pa we've passed one, maybe even two resolutions over this year to deal with returning control of these situations. We still have other people that have responsibilities. Uh, we don't have any statutory responsibilities. I just want you to listen to this um, update, if you don't mind. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Uh, Kendra, I'll go ahead and take these. Um, so again, as Treasurer said, this update is being presented to you through essentially August. The LGC did vote on August 6th to return control both to Cliffside Sanitary <coughs> District and to um, Eureka, the town of Eureka. Um, with regards to Cliffside Sanitary District, um, we are we have not received a response. Uh, um, from the county regarding their appointment of vacancies to the, uh, their, the CSD board. Um, that board has been vacant since at least 2019. In 2019, the LGC adopted a resolution calling on the county to appoint the um, me uh, members to the board to the vacancies. That's actually an obligation that the county has under law to uh, fill those vacancies. Um, we did meet with CSD. Um, their team, I'm sorry, with Rutherford County, and I believe it was May, to let them know that we were wrapping up what staff had to do to get the unit back to compliance with the statutes. And we let them know that we'd be recommending to that the commission adopt a, a formal resolution, essentially giving notice to the county that we were looking to return control. Uh, that the LGC adopted that resolution. Staff met again with county representatives after that to let them know we were getting closer and would be rec making a recommendation. The LGC then voted on the resolution to return control effective August 31st. Um, we have not received information from the county regarding filling vacancies on that board or appointing a finance officer. Um, we are doing all we can. We've I've met with. Um, and we've notified uh, DEQ, the Association of County Commissioners. Um, uh, Cindy has notified the, uh, D, uh, I believe, an agency within DHHS. Um, we've received um, the only the response we received that I've received has been an email um, just stating that they aren't able essentially to do anything at this point. They can't fill 
the board vacancies and they were looking for the LGC's plan on what on how this would move forward as far as operations and governance. So um, that's the status of Cliffside Sanitary District. I have a question. Yeah, Ms. Secretary Marshall. Can they appoint a finance officer without having the board filled? The 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 um, Cliffside, Cliffside Sanitary District Board has to appoint the finance officer. There is no board to appoint a finance officer. But the county has an obligation to appoint vacancies to the CSD. And for how long is that been? Five years. They can't. It's probably longer than that, but okay. thank you. It's probably longer than that, but there was a formal resolution in 2019 by the commission calling on them to appoint the vacancy. So the formal sort of communication between the commission and the county with regards to these vacancies was initiated in 2019. But how long has the county had the responsibility to appoint the board? Since its inception, in well, it's under statute. Um, it, it's elected. They're elected positions, but if there's a vacancy, they are supposed to. Okay. Fill it. Then I'll entertain a motion that we transfer <laughs> Paul Butler's duty station from White Lake <laughs> to Cliffside Sanitary District. Second that. <laughs> in, I would suggest in discussion. that we have a concrete truck <laughs> that happen to drive over a, a a line and break it. Hmm. And it starts backing it up. Somebody's going to want to be moved. Something is going to happen then. I withdraw my motion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and I don't. What if you went to, to Wayne County and and uh, and got on the agenda and just said, "I want it formally known to y'all. This is where you are." Rutherford County. This is Rutherford. Uh, County. Rutherford County. All right, okay. We're transferring your duty station to Rutherford County. All right. Not <laughs> Wayne County. Yeah, all right. How many people live in? How many people are served by this? Fifty-six. It's a small number, and I don't know if so the staff. So there are not a lot of people who have skin in this game. And Correct. One school. One school, I believe, oh, one oh. business. Two schools and maybe How one business. How big is the school? Well, and then there's some requirements on who could be. There are uh, requirements under, this is Chapter 130A of the General Statutes under the Public Health Chapter, um, under the, um, the uh, Sanitary District um, statutes, there is a, re a requirement that it be um, a member, a resident of the district be members. I believe it's 130A-50. I'll That's take right. a look at that. So back in the day, oh. Cone Mills, which was a dying and finishing plant, if my memory's correct, used most of the water and produced most of the sewer, and it went away after NAFTA. And I believe that the Duke Power Cliffside plant is on that system, isn't it? But it's, I'm not sure of that. But that cone mills going away was started the downfall of that because there were less than 100 other customers. And I think a lot of those little houses used to be what in my childhood I knew as mill houses. They were built by the owners for the uh, employees to live in. And so all that's gone away, hence the issues that we see, at least in part. And I don't know what the answer is. So it's statutory as to what the, who it is. So it's not something the county board could weigh to find an exception for. Right. Right. The, and just to be clear, Secretary Marshall's 130A-50 sub B at the bottom, the end of that first paragraph in sub B. Well, I'm sorry, this is the... Um, this is the residence. The members of the sanitary district board shall be residents of the district. <clears throat> there are approximately 80 to 90 customers, two schools, I think one's one, roughly eight to 10 businesses. And Eric said, our staff member Eric said, the Duke Power Plant is not a customer. D Debbie? I wasn't I sure about that. What was the comment? They, did they? Someone said that they tried for some kind of legislative change, but were, someone expressed the question of constitutionality. I'm not sure of the background on that. Okay. Uh, yeah. But right. there are other options for dealing with the situation which have been discussed. We'll go to Eureka. Eureka, um, similarly, the uh, commission voted to return control as of uh, um, <coughs> August 31st. Um, again, the 
uh, the, the charter of Eureka had, had been suspended by the General Assembly from about two, uh, 2019, I believe it was July 1st of 2019, through June 30th of 2024. So those two actions were sort of running uh, in parallel to each other. The, 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 the charter had been suspended, and under the charter suspension, the town was not required to comply with the provisions of the Local Government Budget and Fiscal Control Act during its period of suspension. And at the same time, LGC assumed control, so was essentially um, managing the financial affairs. Um, so both of those sort of, one concluded in the end of uh, June of 2024, and the suspension concluded, then LGC uh, control uh, ended at the end of August. Um, the, the, the members of the board, um, unfortunately, the, uh, my understanding is a few of the members of the board have actually passed away that were on the board when the charter was suspended. Um, they're working, they're actually held, holding a meeting tonight. Um, the town, the two of the members are working to get a meeting together. Um, they're holding a meeting tonight to appoint an interim town attorney, appoint a town clerk, appoint an interim finance director, fill the mayor vacancy, fill the commissioner vacancy, and establish a regular meeting schedule, take necessary actions needed to return um, to, to assume control. Um, this, so they've really stepped up. I know the, the county has stepped up and is trying to assist where they can. Again, uh, DEQ is, is, is aware of this because of the sewer uh, uh, system issues that are down there. Eureka did receive their August bill from Fremont um, for the, uh, the uh, conveyance of their sewer. Um, okay. Their sewer, and it's a, Pause it, it exceeded. And, and yes. Say that sentence again, because this is a very important point. The town of Eureka received their bill from Fremont. Eureka pumps to Fremont. Fremont pumps to Goldsboro. Eureka is billed by Fremont. Fremont issues monthly bills to Eureka for that conveyance service. And the August bill for from Fremont to Eureka was over $100,000 um, because of the inflow and infiltration associated with the system. Essentially, when there's a big rain event, you have a lot of water that you're pumping to be treated that's just rainwater. Um, I looked at our fiscal year 23 numbers. The highest amount that we've ever seen a bill come through for was for about $62,000. Um, so this, again, is just a factor of two things. It's, it's one, the amount of, of rain, and two, the amount of of issues with the, the system. Um, that's not a, an amount of a bill that's um, feasible to be paid by Eureka, which means Eureka is going to struggle to pay Fremont. Um, Fremont then obviously is just a, essentially a pass through to Goldsboro, and so F Fremont has to pay their bills to Goldsboro as well. So this can these issues can impact both. Is it safe to assume that? Fremont's going to have a elevated bill because of the rain, too. So it isn't something that they can just correct. And it's it's not um, right. It, and to the point of that the bills are coming from Fremont. This is Fremont just passing Goes that forward. cost along, and that is under that bill was under the current rates. There is a new rate structure that's going to be imposed, I believe, on October first. Goldsboro increased their rates to Fremont by 17%. Fremont then passed along a 25% increase to Eureka. So this bill, I thought the amount might have been because of the increase in the rates, but it was this bill was actually under the old rates. There's going to be a 25% increase in the amount in in the rate from Fremont to Eureka beginning October 1st, I believe. So the effective date. If the storm hits us again. We're going to get another one of these bills. Eureka will. All right. Um, Ms. Hoffman needs to leave at 3.14. Okay. We're going to. Uh, Secretary Marshall informed me that the chair of the Rutherford County Board of Commissioners is on the. Brian King is on, on what? King's this meeting. Yeah. Mr. King. King. First name. Mr. Brian. or Mrs. Brian. Mr. Mr. <laughs> Brian, B R Y A N. To look it up alphabetically. 
crying. No. Not seeing it. Does he go by any other name? First name. Did he join? What name did he join? There's a Paula Roach from Rutherford County. Oh, Paula, yeah, Paul. let's do Paula. Well, there's three of them on here. Well, we can at least connect. Like somebody's using somebody's account. Paula Roach. Mr. Treasurer, Paula, Paula Roach is the <coughs> finance director. Maybe they're, together. Maybe, they're, maybe they're together. Yeah. Let's see, let's acknowledge this person, and then, uh, then we'll get an update on speed, and then uh, we can adjourn for other for members to get to their other commitments. How many things for you work? All right, let's acknowledge those folks. In life. Is there Ma someone there from Rutherford County? Yes, she's unmuted. You have the floor, Ms. Roach. Can you hear us, Rutherford County? Okay, this is Brian King. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Well, thank you. Thank you for the courtesy. And I appreciate it. We were told in July of the, uh, the handoff back to the Fifth Side Sanitation District. I did reply with a, with a letter um, to the LGC um, the week before the holiday regarding the situation, which is pretty, um, it's pretty dire right now. I have two public schools in our county that are serviced by the Fifth Side Sanitation District. We have people that are um, vendors and employees for the district who are not getting paid. Um, they're looking to be paid, and uh, it's a health crisis, and there's no one, there's no governing body whatsoever um, on the board of Cliffside Sanitation District, no governance whatsoever, and it's going to fail. And, you know, part of the, you know, and, and so what we're asking for is collaboration um, so we can work with our legislators to come up with a solution. In the letter that I did send before the holiday, um, did indicate what our long-term solution and, and goals are, was to um, was to work with the legislature to turn this system over to the Broad River Water Authority, um, but that can't happen in four days, and it can't happen in two weeks. But right now, I'm really fearful that we're going to have health crisis in our county because we don't have anybody there with the authority to um, write checks. And can you explain to our board, this is the treasurer, why you can't afford a, appoint a board? Well, there, actually, we have. Um, prior prior to this week, we have um, every year throughout the years we have sent letters. We have had public meetings. Um, we've had the former commissioner Holland went to the local church. Um, no one wants to serve. I mean, basically, we can't make them do it. There's only like 65 people, and by state law, you have to be a resident of the district in order to serve on the board. And there's there's no will. And so we're we did a last um, last month. We did our last meeting. We just publicly had, you know, we were just begging people to serve. And, you know, now we're in the situation now that I'm, I'm talking to the chairman of, of both of the school board systems that are in the district. We have our public school, Rough County Schools. We have a public charter school, and both of them are on the system. I said, guys, I don't know what you're going to have in the very, very near future because if these workers that haven't been paid, if they drop their tool bags and go home, we're dead, or they're dead, because um, no one's monitoring the system. We just need we need some help or some advocacy, um, collaboration. You know, 90 days or something to you know work with our legislators. I, I have forward I can forward you the information that, that we've done, but um, I don't know what else to do because I don't have the authority to write checks for another governmental unit. I don't have the authority to govern another government unit. And even though one of the comments was made, said, "Well, this is in your county," I said, "So is Forest City, so is Spindle, so is Lake Lower," but I have no governance over them. And so this is a unique situation. Senator Moffitt said, well, this is a quadrant because there's nowhere in state law that says what happens in this situation when you can't have anybody run. Even when we had in the local paper where we're, where we're having elections coming up in November, you know, they're on, we were asking people to you know, sign up to run for the office. Nobody's doing it. Um, it's not a will. Um, and so I'm, I'm just begging. I don't know. Them. I'm just fearful that we're going to have a health crisis in our, in our county. Um, financially, this the Cliffside Sanitation District is getting worse every day um, because there's no one in the captain's chair. And Mr. Chairman, just briefly, if you could appoint someone from outside the district like that, what would that do to solve your problem? Well, sir, according to state law, you have to be a voting um, 
you have to be a voting resident to serve on a district that proposes taxes. But to answer your question, I would actually reach out to the local, uh, the two local school boards, because back in I think it's 15 years ago, um, we tried that because they said they wanted they could have one of their members serve, but we were told then that the state law doesn't allow um, non-residents of a district to serve. But yeah, I mean that's one of the biggest holdups is that you can't, um, you have has to be a resident. But if the law changed and said you did not have to be a resident, how quickly could you resolve the problem if that changed? Were you well, it's not, well, it's not the law, it's the Constitution. I think that'd be unconstitutional. I think it's section, section two. Um, but if, if it was, I mean, I'm saying if, if, if the one, law allowed, excuse me for interrupting, we've got some members getting ready to leave. <clears throat> if the law allowed for you to appoint somebody uh, from the school systems uh, who are customers of the of the system or whatever, if that were allowable, how quickly could you resolve it if that became allowable? Probably pretty quick. I mean, it's, okay. we, we do that with our other, I mean, we do that every June. We did that um, in, in June. We did all our appointments to, to different boards. But in this situation, you have to be a member, you have to be a resident in, in, the, in the district. Um, and that's why we're we actually we're, we're talking to our legislators, Moffitt, um, Moore, and um, Jay Johnson. Um, you know, can you can you change the rules where the district has less than 100, 100 residents? Um, can we waive that requirement of being a citizen? But that still is going to take time, and what we're at now is we're out of time um, because I'm afraid these these workers and contractors that are working at in the district actually doing the job of managing and running, they're going to set the tool bags down and go home because they're not getting paid. Um, I've had at least two instances. I, I know one person that has been paid um, for last month and this month. Um, and I'm, not, and so, I'm not trying to be rude, but the General Assembly has been in session a lot, a lot this year. Uh, while you've done, this is needed to be taken care of. I don't understand the comment. Well, no, what I'm saying is the General Assembly has been active, engaged, in Raleigh, voting on things, technical correction bills, and all kinds of things, you know, for most of this year. And you, I think the county was aware that this was, this was, this was coming down the road. And I'm just saying, I don't, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I'm just trying to figure out how, when you've had all that time all year to get something in technical corrections, you know, five, five, over almost half a year. I'm not. I'm not sure why that didn't happen. Actually, actually, this um, came to us. We were aware of this in July, and um, I've already and I did set up meetings with our representatives. But I really don't know if they took this as. Under, I don't know if they completely understood the impact of what happens if a if the governance of the governing body or governing units turn over to a ghost board. I don't know if everybody fully grasped that, but we're grasping it now. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, um, Secretary Marshall. Well, I have a question, not really for him, and I don't know what I'm talking about. But it sounds like if we could get a declaration of an emergency status, uh, I think there are financial thresholds when it's like a hurricane or things like that. But this would be a health, a localized health emergency that would allow... Uh, somebody to take charge in some way. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think, you know, we've got to. Who generally has the authority to do that? Governor. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it takes a recommendation from uh, Cody Kinsley to the governor that this. Uh, yeah, Mr. County Commissioner, Mr. Yes, ma'am. Brian King. Have, has your health department made a declaration or looked at this, a potential fragile issue that could be pushed up to the state level? I recognize, I recognize that the, um, I believe the state has, the state and DHHS has still spoken to our local health district, um, Karen Powell. I've tried to reach out to her twice today and have not been able to connect to, to, make, her, to make her aware. Um, I have spoken to, through Christy with the governor's office uh, and been copying him on this. Um, and I asked a very similar question last week would this fall under an emergency action yeah. if it fails? 
but these the citizens in this community are the poorest of the poor in our community i don't hate to say it i don't say it publicly but demographically they're not as well off i don't know i mean i don't want to put the burden of them having to put um these little um you know outdoor places to go to the bathroom what do you call them? porta potties at every house when this fails uh, i don't know if they have the financial capacity to do that um and then we have our two public schools on uh, we're looking for somehow to you know, because the financial if you look at it and, and i believe i read in your rules if a government unit has failed or is most likely to fail we can um you got lgc can pick up and take over but that's it i may be misquoting i'm sorry but 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 the thing is that's not a solution that's a band-aid and our what i the letter that i sent or right before the holiday break was our long-term solution is to have our broad river water authority take over um the district but that's not going to happen in four days that's not going to happen one day so i just i mean i appreciate everything guys you've done um i'm just begging for help but i don't know what the answer is well, i think secretary marshall's got a i don't know if it's a fat rabbit or skinny rabbit but she's got a rabbit of some kind uh that maybe we can pursue and report back to the lgc in the in the short period of time and to you also sir and, and sir yes, i know you can't speak for all your county commissioners but would your board be willing you think predict possibly to advance the necessary funds until some other more permanent solution came along? Funds to yeah, another no, no government. I don't know if we have the authority to do that or not. The state may. State of emergency might could suspend some things. Secretary Marshall, Please. the 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 CSD we did adopt the commission adopted a budget for CSD that levied a tax. So those funds, I'm not. There should be revenue. There should be revenue um, coming there in. Is. Just to address your question about um, Tony, ad advanced you. funds. Um, let me there is there, there is funding. Like with, uh, Cliffside has funding because they're a taxing authority. Their own. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So there's money there. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, this is the treasurer. We'll uh, <coughs> uh, we'll take the rabbit that uh, Secretary Marshall has and put our and through DEQ, through the governor's office, figure out if there's some way for them to uh, declare something that has the word emergency in it <clears throat> so that you can appoint a board and get these folks paid. Someone has to have the authority to spend the money. So right. Thank you so much, sir. I, I really do appreciate your time. So, yeah. Okay. Now tell me why we can't take the authority back. And there's two conditions under statute 159 181c that allow for the lgc to assume control one is either after notice and warning a unit fails to comply with the provisions of statute and the other is if the unit is about to or in the opinion of the commission will default on debt the the csd has no outstanding debt so that one is not applicable the but other it's one default because it won't pay because it's not going to pay well i think this the statute addressed sort of outstanding uh, public bonds and, and things like that. Um, the other, with regards to them being out of compliance, um, that finance officer. I mean, you got to have personnel to be out of compliance. Yes. Well, they're out of compliance without a finance officer. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, that's all, Treasurer. You got speed. Oh, speed. Um, just following up on the meeting. Um, well, don't have speed. You Spencer Mountain. Uh, and there is nothing in your unit updates. To, uh, Secretary Marshall mentioned Spencer Mountain. Again, there's no financial activity there. We just provide an annual update that we provided last month. Um, in the last meeting, when we uh, talked about the uh, withholding of sales tax for units that hadn't submitted audits, um, the commission voted to withhold uh, uh, portions of sales tax distributions from five units. Towns of Black Creek, Colerain, Littleton, Lucama, and Speed. Um, those notifications were all provided to those towns, and Secretary Penny's office has been notified as well to initiate those withholdings along um, with the withholding schedule for each unit and how much would be withheld each month. Um, and again, appreciate Secretary Penny's staff um, for working with us so closely and well on that process. I don't think that happens before. 
November. November, correct. So although we provided that notice to Secretary Penny's office because of the timing of their processes, the first withholding would begin in uh, October. Uh, 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 or November. 30, think, 45 days. November, you're right, November. It was November. Days is November. Um, sec, um, uh, Treasurer Falwell had also asked us after the discussions with the town of Speed last time to talk to them about their um, options for uh, city-initiated dissolution of their charter. Uh, we did, Kendra Boyle and I, the Director of Fiscal Management and I went down to present at a Speed Town Council meeting. Um, we outlined a number of ways they are not complying with the statutes in addition to their late audits. They haven't submitted their cash and investment reports. They have another a number of issues of non-compliance. Um, we offered them an outline of how they could initiate dissolution of their charter and they at this time are not interested in pursuing that option. Uh, they are hoping, uh, they said, to get caught up. Um, so we did present the information to them, provided them with written materials to leave behind, um, both on what they needed to do to comply with the law, uh, the Local Government Budget and Fiscal Control Act, as well as what they would need to do if they wanted to initiate. I created a little checklist for them of how to initiate um, the solution if they so chose. But at this time, they are not interested in pursuing that option. Thank you. And anecdotally, as far as the withholding is concerned, uh, there's a possibility that some of these communities have said we'd just rather have the withholding and not be worried about ever doing an audit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, sorry, was that misstated? Not attributed to anybody here, but anyway. Okay. Uh, anything else? Yes, sir. Our next uh, local government commission meeting is on October 1st. I appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, this evening. Uh, in honor of Representative uh, Kelly Alexander, uh, I'll move a motion to adjourn. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing down the clerk call roll. Oh, sorry, I missed the motion in a second. There it is. I made a motion. Thank you. Oh, yeah, okay. I got pens. I think a couple of members are already up. Members. Daughter sure. Holmes is gone. She's gone. She's gone. Well, by everybody say aye if you're in favor of adjournment. Aye. aye. Thank you. Aye. Is he opposed? None. We're adjourned. I've had a hard time. Thank you. Hearing